we'll go ahead and get started. It's 8 o'clock. Obviously, Dr. Crandall needs less of an introduction than myself, but um, we're very lucky to have Dr. Crandall with us. His li list of accomplishments and awards is longer than we need to go over. I will just say from a resident perspective, I know that all of the current residents and residents I've spoke to are so extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity to work with him. And I know that the current residents are very grateful for the faculty who let us go up and attend this course as well during January. So um, thank you so much for the faculty who support us in going to that as well. Without further ado, Dr. Crandall. All right. Well, today I thought I'd do a little bit differently than we, than we normally do. Uh, just for a couple of reasons. See if I can tie it under my bowl. Does that work? Okay. I'm hoping for a. Uh, I was trying to get a uh, very interesting patient complaint. Uh, uh, we 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 videoed it last week, but we. Uh, I wanted to see. She wrote me a five-page letter of introduction, which I think ran. That's always, that's always scary. When you well, this is, uh, uh, well, Nick, see, Nick see, has seen the letter, uh, but it's an interesting thing because she was 100% cured by the surgery that we did, and she was like uh, two, s 10 months of complete misery from positive dyslipidopsia. So today, I'm going to present a couple of things about some of the new stuff that we're looking at. I think everybody here is pretty much aware of femtoseconds, but uh, I'm going to present this in two sections. The first section is going to be so that Randy and everybody else can argue, which I think is valid. <laughs> Be, and there's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a really important point because I think everybody's missing the boat on what femtosecond is ultimately going to be. And uh, we'll see if we, we'll argue a little bit about that. So today's going to be more of a fun discussion type of, of uh, grand rounds than a, than a uh, this is what we're doing type of grand rounds. So, Let's talk a little bit. We're, so the first thing we're going to do is we'll talk a little bit about femtoseconds. Then the next thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about positive dyslipopsia. I'm waiting for Eliana to come in, and if she doesn't come, I still have the, the slides anyway. And I think you saw those slides, didn't you, Nick? Okay, good. So <coughs> hey, let's talk a little bit about uh, femtoseconds. Uh, uh, just so everybody knows, I do uh, consult for Alcon, and, and because I'm talking about the lens X, I do that. I also consult for for uh, AMO and also for BNL and also <coughs> for DORC, which is a, a Dutch ophthalmic company in the, in the refractive medium. Now, here's, here's one huge controversy, of course. Uh, it's a $450,000 machine. Fortunately, well, you can use a wheel and deal and get it for around 200000 And if you further wheel and deal, you can do studies for the company and, and reduce it. And if you further wheel and deal, you can buy lenses from them and end up paying almost nothing for the, the machine. There are lots of tricks to get the machine into your, into your clinic if you're big enough to do it. But one thing you do have to understand is that reimbursement is a humongous itch issue. The Medicare does not care how you do a cataract. And that can include such things as intracap, extracap, FACO, Femto, any way you want to do the cataract. They're going to give you X amount of dollars, and you're going to get your, your reimbursement that you're going to take home or your ASC is going to take home is based on, on that. And almost all carriers follow Medicare's guidelines. So when we, Randy and I started, <coughs> the average fee for an intracap was $2,500. That, that was in the that was in the late 70s. So it'd be about six thousand dollars now, uh, and the AS the, your uh, facility could charge about nine hundred and fifty, as I recall, for the intraocular lens, which they bought for five hundred dollars, which the company made for a dollar back then. Is that is that correct? Okay. So as things have gotten, our you know all the changes have occurred, and I think, and also you know, the other thing that was interesting is in that era everybody was hospitalized. So you could actually bill also for your hospital visit. Um, when we started, it was probably 10 days in the hospital. By the time we ended, ended, ended the career, it was five days in the hospital. The next year, it was two days, three days, one day, you know, 20 minutes, whatever we do now. 
So there's been a humongous change, and all of that is kind of ratcheted down the, the amount of money one can bill for the surgery. So it is really important to understand that, that when you introduce any new technology into your system, it can be incredibly expensive to the team. So we also need to look at what I think are some of the potentials of December 2nd, and then we'll show a couple things. We'll talk about what, what's being talked about now, which is a little bit of uh, BS. Um, but also there's some, some, real, some, some real potential value for the pe femtosecond in real cataracts, not just in refractive cataracts. So let's, if we look at the pros, there's no question. You can get the, there's an incredible development. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, one of the facilities I work at has had the, the Femto for two years. We're in our sixth software upgrade and our third uh, hardware upgrade in less than two years. And all the companies are rapidly approaching e each other. One of the interesting issues is because all these machines are similar in nature to uh, the uh, uh, femtosecond used for uh, uh, LASIK type procedures. Initially, we didn't even have spectrometry that would work in these, in these older eyes. Uh, patients with boggy conjunctiva, you couldn't dock. It was really difficult to do a lot of these. Huge, in our, in the, with the lens X, you get big subcon hemorrhages, which you get much less with the um, newer soft fit that they have, but also zero in the Optometica type instrumentation. And so, but do docking still remains an issue. And the other question was of pressures. We're, they're working on that pretty much now. Most of the dockings are under uh, 35 millimeters. Uh, but in the original, Alcons was probably at the, I'd say 40 range. And if you dock somebody 40, 50 for any length of time, that it certainly could be an issue for somebody that has an endangered optic nerve. Any luck, Paula, or no? Okay, it's not ready for prime time. I was going to still show the case anyway. So it, uh, is, uh, I was hoping to show you her, her complaints, but I'll, I'll let uh, Nick, he, he saw him, so I, I'm not lying to you. So, uh, so the, the issue with uh, the traditional, of course, would be incisions made with a blade. And incidentally, no femtosecond makes a, an incision that's as good as a diamond incision or as good as the one we make now. None of them. Uh, that won't be the case in the future, I hope. But now, frequently, I'll abort the, the uh, I'll do the LRIs because I think they are real, but I, but I often abort the, uh, the, uh, uh, the regular incision. And you still need ultrasonic phaco, uh, not all the time, but certainly uh, le less than, than before. And then we won't talk about the limitations of traditional. We all know those. Uh, Any time you have excess phaco time, you can get burns, endothelial cell loss. Uh, the LRIs uh, are really surgeon dependent. Some are tremendously good. Some are variable. And then, of course, the variable of the, of the capsule rectus. And uh, we all know the importance of the capsule rectus. It is incredibly important for the outcome of, the, of most of the surgery. And certainly, if you're looking at a, at the, a surgery, cataract surgery as, as a um, refractive uh, piece, which is becoming more and more important in what we do, then we want to talk, then we want to be able to do that. And if we look at this, th some of the studies have been done. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of work that has to be done on the back end if you're really looking at it from a refractive standpoint. Now, there's lots of issues with that right now because even though the, the, uh, our, our formula are getting better and better, and since the regression formulas were getting better even with LASIK and all those things, nevertheless, there's still a fair amount of, of leeway that can occur in an individual patient. And if we can get rid of that, it would be helpful. The other big problem, other than one company now, uh, we still can't get uh, lenses that are plus or minus that are more than less than a half diopter, so you're always going to have some swing uh, with the with what you want it to be, and so he here is what's being touted as the as the big thing for femtosecond, increasing your precision, reducing your variability, and achieving ex expected outcome r result. I'm not arguing with that. I'm going to let Ar Randy argue about that in just a minute. Um, because, but I, because I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the real things that we can do. 
This is some of the work that Bob and I have done looking at uh, uh, SIA, which is surgically induced astigmatism, doing one eye versus the other eye, looking at the types of incisions, looking at the arcuate incisions, these are with OCTs. And the, the beauty of the machine is undoubtedly in two, two areas, actually I think three areas. One is, the, one is the rexus, two is the LRIs, and three is the ability to ultimately reduce the, um, pos or the, the, the ultrasound power, not getting rid of it, but possibly reduce it. But it also induces some other interesting problems. One of them is, uh, has any, there, does everybody, is everybody here probably half, maybe half have seen a femtosecond? Or how many have actually seen it done? Okay. So this will be good for the neuro ophthalmologist and the and every, uh, no, I suppose our glaucoma guys might not have anyway. So at any rate, this is, the, this is a classic uh, rexus. Now, as everybody knows, uh, I, uh, we now measure. We put a, I put a marker on the cornea. I don't dilate the patient. I have the patient look at a red fixation light so I know exactly where their optical center is. I put, the, put my 5.75 millimeter re uh, thing on, and I can do a pretty good rexus. And I think I can approach this about whether or not I, I can't get it that perfect, no matter how hard I try. There's no question. So we're looking at all these things. And I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the bottom two in a minute. So if we look at the reproducibility, this is, there's no question. I don't think there's any question about the reproducibility of, of the rexus. Um, again, all these are, are these, this is, uh, Bob did himself, or not Bob, Zaggy did in, um, Remind me, is he, Arme where is he, Armenia, Poland, uh, Hungary. Hungary, okay, Budapest. Budapest. He's in Budapest. And he probably has done more, I think probably more femto than m almost anybody. Uh, he's had a machine probably for five years. I think he has three machines. I think now that somebody that's approaching him is uh, Burkhardt Bick in Germany, and Burkhardt uh, has a, um, I think he has, uh, probably has three machines, but he usually uses the, uh, catalyst unit for most of his work, and we'll talk about why there's advantages of, of the different systems. So this is this is the kind of stuff that that the refractive guys are really looking at is is the ability to optimize lens constant. You got uh, Warren uh, Hill who's working on these things, and and they're really trying to ratchet it down so you can get very uh, very controlled. Um, uh, air distributions on our machines, and we're comparing them to what we do manually, doing right eye and left eye. And what it turns out to be is that a good surgeon does, gets pretty damn good results, and it may be a hair better uh, in terms of the refractive predictability because of the potential for better ELP prediction, effective lens position. And with that, I'm going to stop for a second and let Randy argue about why that may be BS at this point. Most of what we're seeing, I think, in the, in the in the literature and on the f on the floor, is a little BS. But I want to I'll let Randy comment about that. So uh, <coughs> his didn't. argument is that if you do very precise aphorexies, if from that you have better prediction of effective lens position. So you understand that if you do a formula and we try to figure out what our results are, the one area that is a big gap um, is where that. Yeah. Certainly, you want to get them in a half diopter. Yeah. So, the uh, hypothesis has been if you can make a perfect catheter rectus, and you can insert very even force on the leg, then the lens is more likely to be predictable than the So, um, the one has done the most work on that, which I believe is actually Bob Schumer. Yeah. This is the one that people have looked at the most, and, and more and more people are taking that as a given. And so, um, what I can say is, and, and he really wanted to talk about it because he was, I think he was there for the talk, is a very good group out of Vienna who does good work. I mean, the Zulis group do excellent work. This is uh, Rupert Menopoxy, Oliver Sundo, not because he's a Oliver Sundo, presented it. 
they said, okay, let, let's just test that hypothesis. And they're famous for doing that. So they took a series of patients with a manual papsilorectomy, and they took uh, all different kinds of variations to see if whether it's right on or not would predict the effective length of the patient. And in the end, with 18 people, it did not. And it's the first person to really look at that in a very aggressive fashion. And so now you've got two different schools of thought out there, uh, but this has kind of shown a bit of a breakthrough the last few decades. It's almost a trend going forward from absolutely we're going to get you know better prediction in the first instance of stuffing. And uh, I think the answer's up in the air. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure which no, one's right or wrong. Uh, no, I agree, but I'm just saying that that, yeah. that to me, from what I've reviewed and seen, that is a very provocative study. It's yep. going to the food and the literature, and knowing that group is going to be very, very rigorous in what they put together. And so my question, I think it's an open question. I just, I'm not, I've always been suspicious that, that the good overlap of the factors and the idea that you get some very comfortable, wildly, Yeah, I was there. I was there. Yeah. Now, correct. And and if you look at the numbers that that, that, that have come out of most of the studies in the U.S., and I think that's one of my points is evaluating the literature. You have to look at numbers, and you also really have to look at that first slide that I gave you. That is, do I have a bias? Because I'm a, I'm a, uh, not necessarily me, but whoever it is has a bias for whatever they're talking about. Go ahead, and that, that would, be, I, that would, Nick would uh, maybe comment a little bit on that because it's really critical when you, as you guys evaluate the literature on that. I mean, uh, talk a little bit about bias in, in the literature. Touting it is a very big difference, and, and that's what I'm seeing in a lot of the literature here. Right. They're saying that, uh, oh yes, this is much more accurate, and it's, it's no, it's a little bit more accurate. Yeah, and that's that's the point I wanted to bring out. And then if we look at variability again, look at the if you look at the two graphs um, again, smaller numbers. These are numbers we had uh, last year. 0.25 diopters. We don't have a lens that makes you well. We do have one, the, I think the Softec HD has quarter diopters, uh, but that's also an interesting lens too. It's one of the cases I am going to show a little bit of is uh, a patient with that. So if we look at the pr predictability of the lens ELP in, this in the study that we did, it was small uh, variability, but again, it depends on how you pre present the data. I mean, you look at the slides, I sure as hell can't read that slide. I don't know about you guys, but... Uh, I mean, somebody can look at it and tell you exactly what it means. I mean, I know what it means because we wrote it. But if I, s if I look at that, <laughs> if I look at that in a paper, I ain't going to spend two hours looking at that little data and try to figure it out. So that's sort of my point in talking about it. Now, this is real. I, I don't think there's any question about this part of it. There is a significant or can be a small in a soft eye to a large uh, reduction in the in the – CDE and everybody, uh, for those that don't know, what they're talking about there is the cumulative delivered energy. Each machine measures it differently. And that's always a problem when you try to compare different machines. Each company has their own way of telling you how much energy you just used. But you can ultimately go back to, to, you can go back as far as the beginning programs, but they, and you can get it the same thing on every machine, but it's not easy to do if you're just punching the buttons in the OR. That's a balance. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I did yeah. a bunch of things with the, the catalog down to the next one. Call it. When you take a, you know, if we had a pretty four plus and, mm -hmm. and the thing just breaks apart into small pieces. I mean, I think this one, but, but the next step from that is going to be harder. Does that difference in CDE make a difference in all? Correct. That's the hardest one. 
I think right now that this is this is one thing we can say yes, and, and the other the question is with good uh, with good uh, uh, viscoelastics, with good techniques, being at the plane of the iris rather than up in the thing. Is any of this going to truly make a difference? Don't know, but this part is real. And then the other part, let me just, for those that haven't seen, I'll just do a quick, just show you what it, what it looks like. This is, a, this is an eye that's been docked. This is with an older, the older software. It's going to take about uh, 12 to 14 seconds to do the Rexus, which is now down to five, uh, five to six seconds in, the, in this machine. This is, this is docking, we're measuring the thickness of the cornea up there, or the capsule Rexus up there. That's the capsule. And I'm going to stop this for just a second because this is critical. Uh, if you look at that, the gates on the right side, well, <coughs> didn't stop it, let's try that. If you look at the gates on the right side, one of the things that's different when you do a femtosecond is you are, you're aiming the laser 300 microns above the capsule, 300 microns into the capsule. So if your docking is not perfect, in other words, the, if you have a little tilt in your dock, and some of the machines have a good way of, of doing that, some of them a less better way, some of them are active when looking at the OCT, but the docking is critical because if you are, if the eye is tilted at all, you can either totally miss the rexus on one side and you're cutting the hell out of it on the other side, and if it's not docked correctly, it'll cut anything it eats on the way, which can be the iris. Um, and this is sort of critical. The other part that this, that you don't realize when you start doing these, is you're cutting off all of the handles for your INA. So what used to be the simplest part of the procedure, irrigation aspiration, becomes much more tedious and often you have to go to by manual. It, it's t it takes a lot, that's a, that's a, a new training phase. Did you find that case, Randy? So if we look at this, this is the, the machine's now doing the capsule rexus and you can see the, uh, the capsule being formed right up here. <coughs> if, it gets, if, I, if I can get it to go forward, that is. Okay, there, the capsule rexus is being done. And soon after the capsule rexus, you're going to see a divide pattern. This is an older pattern now. The, the, they all have cubes. They all have different ways of, do, of doing that. So that's, that's breaking up the cataract. And uh, then we'll take the patient to the OR and complete the case after, after it's done, the LRIs, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let that run through. This is, again, last year's stuff. It's, it's about five times quicker now. And the gates, are in this case, were 300. The gates are now 200 in the, in the machine. So again, so does every, everybody understand what the machine's doing now? The machine is breaking up. The the now it's the corneal incision. There's the second hand incision, which I still think is better with the diamond. And then here's a case, we just open those, uh, you pull out the rexus, uh, which in this case we were about 98% perfect, now it's, all, it now it's pretty close to 100% perfect in terms of, of being able to produce it. This is some of the new software, you'll see it's, it's a much quicker procedure. Uh, this was six months ago, so this is one, or four months ago, so this is one uh, iteration behind. But now it's down to, it takes about, a uh, minute and a half to two minutes to do the entire procedure, so it doesn't really slow you down too much in the OR. But it, and the and you can and by the way, you can change the position of that rexus, which I think is critical for what I what I want to discuss a little bit now. So that's the new software, and this is. Right. Yeah. And showing it's making this corneal incision. Some people are, are saying they're. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, and, and that's true with all of them. The reason, the reason is again, the one of the issues is this area, because if your patient has any panis, any blood vessels in the, in the surface of the cornea, it can't cut through those. So it aborts it or it cuts partially. So a lot of times I'll just abort those, and if anybody has a trigium, forget it. 
pretty much. You can, it's even docking with the pterygium is kind of hard. So we can usually do people with tinguecula, but that's not even, sometimes that's not given. With the soft fits, you can now do that, or with the liquid interface, you can now do that. But now, this is what I want to talk about. I want to show a couple cases, because I think this, the real, <coughs> for me, the value of the femtosecond is not going to be in refractive, because I'll let Randy and the corny guys take care of those guys. It's going to be in the, it's going to be in the tough cases. It's going to be in pseudo exfoliation. It's going to be in loose nonules. And uh, this is a case, I'll just show you the, let's get to the action. The fact is we decent, the beauty of it is you can decenter the rectus and put it anywhere you want it. So what I'm going to love it is when we can actually take it in the OR with my kids with, the, see, you see, so you see it's being decentered. You see the tilt's a little bit interesting there. Okay, so there's the, there's this, this is a congenital Marfan syndrome. It's not, uh, the patient's about 12 years old or 14 years old, I think, so. But you can see, that's the problem with... Doing a capture the rectus in that, with, you know, in, in a regular way is... is it's hard, yeah. It's just quite so, nice and so what I do, what I normally do when I'm doing a, a rectus like that now is I do a bimanual. So I start in the middle, I hold the, the lens so it can't move, I make a puncture with my right hand, I start the rectus, I put in, I put in hooks, then I do a little bit more, put in hooks, do a little bit more, rotate the lens down, and I, you know, I can do them, but this would save me the most critical step in doing that. So, and then the other time I think it's a value is in the management of, in, of these cases. So here's a case from two years ago, and everybody's had this. You, you open it up, and you have an Argentinian flag. Blue, white, blue. That's, what the, that's where that term comes from. So uh, what we can do with those is the rexus. I don't care if you do anything else. You get a rexus perfect and a white cataract. It, the most of those, quite frankly, are relatively a piece of cake once you get the rexus done. And you, so you can do it. Bingo, you're done. You can go to the OR in the case. Yeah, boom. But I can do it now in five seconds, four to five seconds. So it, you know, you're going to get a little pressure, but it does complete. I've we've done about. 15 of them now, so it just makes, makes the thing easier. So I'm going to escape out of that, and I want to show one other situation I'm going to bring up, because we're also, by the way, we're getting into a new generation of FACO machines now. Uh, all three, co all th well actually four companies, including Dutch Ophthalmic, are coming out with different things, and I so I want to just show two quick videos. So let's look at this one. Okay, so this is a case I did. So I've done the, this guy was sent down to have a um, eye stent done with, for, with his uh, with a surgeon up in Idaho started the case and realized that he couldn't do, he was gonna do a, a FACO and eye stent and the lens was fairly mobile as in zero zonules. Zero, so he decided he couldn't do it. He sent her down, sent him down. So it, uh, we ended up doing real, real glaucoma surgery rather than MIGS because MIGS will get you three, four points, which may be very important. I'm not arguing about that. We'll talk about that sometime. But you, 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 this is beautiful case. So I did the. Uh, you see here, I've made no incisions. I've done nothing else. I didn't do any. Um, I didn't do any breaking up of the cataract because in the other eye, when I did it, the lens moved. It shaked. So I, I didn't know where, you, I had to abort that because the, it could have popped through the capsule. I didn't know what the capsule was going to do. So this is the case. I just thought you might be interested to see where I think there's some value in the femtosecond. Now watch the lens as I go across here. And you'll see that the first part, I'm going to have a little trouble because it's fairly shallow. And watch the lens go back and do its correct position. So there are zero zonules in this guy's eye too. So I'm just pulling off the, the making sure I still, in a case like this, I still assume that there are attachments and I'm able to uh, remove the rest of the cataract or the rexus. And so now all I have to do the is. The regular cataract in this case. Would, it would have been oh. very, well. It was loose and everything. It was loose all the way around. So, and it was, it was not, it was a fairly hard cataract as well. So all I, all I end up doing here 
So this shows the value of the femto. This is the new sovereign unit. So I was going to bring, I, I'm not sovereign, excuse me, um, centurion. So each, each of the companies are now coming out with their next generation. We've had the same technology for 11 years now. And so what all they're doing now is they're working on their pump systems. They're working on their more, uh, more predictability and on reducing their, their uh, thing. So you see here I put uh, mask L, or not mask L, MST hooks in. But I w uh, you can, one of the things about the nice things about this, and I want everybody to look at one thing. Look up in the right side. Everybody freaks when they first see this. It says intraocular pressure of 60. That's a hell of a lot of pressure, isn't it? Does anybody know what a bottle height of 105 is? About 80. So all of us think we were, were you know, so when your p bottle height goes from zero to 80, well, that's why a lot of times you'll see a chamber deep and you'll see you'll get some high, high fluid move. Some if there's loose onules, it'll go behind or you get fluid misdirection syndromes. So a lot of times when I'm doing a difficult case, I drop the bottle of 40 and then raise it up after I get in so that we, they don't get that. And then I reduce it as I'm coming out so we don't get the sudden surge. But don't kid yourselves, that pressure is pretty high. Randy, you did studies on that. So that's when you have your steady pressure and you're not doing any studies. Right. Uh, you've got a couple other things going on yeah. that obviously are wounded that, and the leak around your instrumentation. And uh, the, the advantage of these newer systems that are coming in play, and I'm just looking at the next round, Centurion. Yep. Yeah, Solaris already had it, and, and I know that AMO is coming out with. Pressure, yeah, the so you're going to actually generate this pressure. You check your bottle, and it all depends upon the, the, the gravity and how much. And now there, there is going to be an, an active, both sensing of pressure, trying to create and keep your pressure at, at a constant level. Right. And it'll be interesting to see if you do that at higher levels, if that can create more problems uh, so in association with uh, some you know, end stage glaucoma, because it, I think. Got high pressures before, uh, as it was leaking around your wound, or you had an infection. Those pressures were just fluctuating. Okay, so that, so those we're going to be evaluate, beginning the evaluations of these new machines. Yeah. How are you calculating your gain with that pressure? Is it just based it, on what setting you have? No, 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 You're no, no. It the measures the pressure with sensors. Yep. Yep. No, well, it's on it's on the machine on the handpiece of the machine. Yeah, and so what it does is, right, yeah, and so what it does, it doesn't have a bottle anymore, it doesn't have a bottle, it, the bottle is the inside a casing similar to what the retina machines are, pressurized. it's pressurized. It's changing, it'll, it'll drop to zero and move, so we're, we're now just putting control on that element that before was all just passive, it's whatever height you get in each structure you're working on. Now I just want to quickly talk about, I, and I think, yeah, yeah. Essentially, this is this is this is the retinal unit put yeah. together with the infinity machine. Yeah. So is that really the actual that is the actual pressure in the eye. Exactly. We we've always had when we when we had when we do our surgeries, you know, if you walk in the OR, Judith, you'll see you've seen the bottle hanging down, right? That all we what we've controlled is bottle height. So if you look at all my all the other videos, you'll see something that says 105, 110. If you're Dick McCool, 150 uh, up that by height. If you see uh, different, different machines that gives you the bottle height. And then we know from studies that have been done in laboratories, I think Randy did one of the early studies, that correlates to a pressure of about, if it's, a, if it's 100, it's about a pressure of 90 in the eye. So if, you, if you're just infusing the eye for whatever reason, that's a big pressure. And it may be why some people with optic nerves that are very tentative have issues. For example, if somebody has had a non-ischemic aortic problem in one eye, then I do everything in the other eye to protect the patient against that. So I do a low flow, really slow system. Because they, cause they, they are at risk for the second eye having the same thing. And I think this may be a reason. You've got high fluctuations, 90 to zero, that kind of thing. And the other thing that everybody does, or I assume they know, but maybe don't know, is that that bottle height is from, from the certain level of the machine. So a tall guy who's, who's sitting up here, 
his bottle height is, or hers is lower than Darcy's or Leah's, you know, because they're down here, and so their bottle height, it's, the machine says 90, there it's 90, for somebody else it's up here. So Brad and I have a different bottle height if we assume the same height or different pressure in the eye. So there's all, there's all these variables that we never talk about, although I bitch and moan about them, but they, I, don't, I don't get much, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is positive dysphotopsia. So I have, in the last, and I thought this was an appropriate time, there's, so in the last week, uh, which I hope doesn't continue, I've done seven IOL exchanges, three for positive dysphotopsia, four for negative. And I'm going to show you one of the positives now, and uh, just a quick one. I won't, okay. That is a patient three and a half years out of surgery, three and a half years out of surgery, uh, who is complaining of mild uh, positive dysphotopsia. She couldn't see very much. And if you, I don't know if you can tell right now, but this is a, a, a restore, I think. <laughs> it was a restore. So she paid $6,000 to have this lens put in. And we'll just go to the, so all I did was uh, bring it out, but I did want to show a little bit of the bringing out part. If I can get to it, I mean, that might be the second part. Sorry about that, you guys. I'm, I wanted to show that, but, because getting these lenses out of the bag is not the easiest thing in the world to do. See if I, I, think, I think this is it. And I just want to show one thing. Yeah, this is her. So one of the things you have, if the, if the surgeon's done a good job, and this surgeon has because they use the femtosecond laser. So getting into those is not the easiest thing. The f one thing I love is using a viscocanalostomy cannula because that cannula is a 32 gauge. I can get underneath it very easily. So we have those upstairs and it's much, much easier to get into these. In this case, what I'm going to use is a, um, the other thing that's nice is the blunt retrobulbar needle because you can, it's, it's blunt and you can get into it. And I'll just show you that part and then I'm going to show you. So that's that. So we finally get in and you, what you have to do is you have to hydrodissect or viscodissect, excuse me, all the way around. Now the trick with any of these lenses is not, the, is not this part. This is all easy. What you have to know is you have to see, you see this, let me move this out of the way. If you look at this right here, that that's, is so socked in with the lens and it isn't, that isn't the problem, it's where I'm shooting right now. Because what happens in these, the, the, the haptic goes out and there's a little ball out there. And that little ball is incredibly hard to go. I don't, it is a pain. Yeah. But that, you know what? I got to tell you, the soft tech I did last week was harder to get out than this one. That was the lady I was going to present today. I, I'm gonna, I'll present her some other time. Because she was, she's the one with the. It was, I couldn't, it was the hardest of the six lenses. They wouldn't come out. So let, let, let me just. Oh, I, well, I use, I use viscoat to protect the cornea, and then I use a cohesive, because I think they're easier to, 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 to get them around, to get dissect out the capsule. So in this case, I think I'm using viscoat or discovis. Okay. And I don't, I don't, I'm going to let Nick talk about this. I'm just going to, I'm going to, we don't need to watch the rest of this. I'll show this. Anybody is uh, available to get that out. But one of the things is do not pull to the center of the, of the thing. Everybody wants to get the lens out by pulling this way. What you have to do is you have to do these two instruments and you counterclockwise so that, that it, so that it pops out of its thing. And I've got a set of videos if those, anybody wants to see those. We don't have enough time this morning. But I want Nick to talk about this because this is, this is th this lady. Let's pour it in. And th is this is the lens. Okay, no, I was hoping she was she here. Did, she did this picture. Yeah. Absolutely give her credit. And <coughs> but I mean, these are some significant scratches on the surface. <laughs> so you can imagine what that's going to do to the optics of a multifocal implant. Yeah. No, no, they can't be red. I think that I think they gouged it when they did it. There's no. It was on the anterior surface, not the. Anterior this surface. is the anterior. Seeing that stuff on there, I thought, what in the world did they use a wire brush on that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe when they were loading it, they stretched across it. And there, there, you can see the uh, the multifocal aspect of it. But look, I mean, look at the, 
the number of scratches that are on this one. Let's look at this next one. Could it be the injector? Yes, it could be. Yeah, it could be the injector. It could be how they what instrument they grabbed it with. That happens all the time. So I'm going to ask. But look at, look at how the injector thing side angle. Usually they were centering it. I think they were centering it. Center and it's pretty straight. Okay. Going along. There, yeah. There's and more usually the posterior, the injector, if it does, kind of it won't override on top. It's yeah. So you look if you look at and th even on th look at this is. So that's I think there's this is the haptic of this IOL. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the residents. You're in the OR day one, and you see that because it was there. That didn't that didn't happen the day afterwards, and the surgeon told him it came from the company that way. So you can see on your on your you can see in oh yeah. Photographs. Oh, I've got even I've got even nice photographs for we're doing a nice report on this for uh, JCRS. But uh, so w my question is, what do you do? You take it out. Absolutely. You don't pretend that you can't see those scratches. And that's exactly what they did. And three years later, they were pretending that they were the perfect They said it was perfect. So, yes. Did you see a clinic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was bad. Yeah, so those, that, that is, th this is true positive dysphotopsia. And that, the other case I was going to show is more, is more interesting because of the complaints of the lady. She's my lady, and I'll tell you a little story about her. She, was, she came from, or was referred down from Oregon. Uh, uh, Rich Hoffman referred her because he didn't want to do the case. It turns out that she's a PhD in biostatistics. So I got a five-page thing about how her outlier, she was an outlier, mm -hmm. and she, in, she told me what statistics she used to prove that she, this shouldn't have happened to her. But the point was, it was near, so yeah, she was, uh, she was, she used a two-tailed test, uh, 17 to, no, no, she wasn't multi, she, no, she wasn't a multifocal, believe it or not. She was just a, she, and I wanted, this is what I wanted to do here, it was a pure positive dysphotopsia that people told her she was crazy. It was the soft tech HD lens. And she went to nine different people before she was told to either come to you, me, or mask it. And I'll bet you in the recovery room, she was in tears. She, she, was, she was crying. She was so happy. She was cured, yeah, she was cured. I just got a letter from her yesterday, and I want to show you what she I'm, I'm sorry to take up so much time, but I think this is critical. These are some of my after patients, but they're also the descriptions of Peter. Well, yeah, she's, here's a lady that's been, you know, 19... L literally nine. Is that today? Let me go back. Come on. Look for somebody that says Gia. Yeah, they, just, they are actually good. That, that, that's, I, I get that every Tuesday, by the way, if you're, anybody's interested. That was just this yesterday, I know. Anybody see a Mr. Burgess? No, no. Well, maybe I can't show it to you. But she had she had drawn 20 pictures of what she sees, and they were classic positive dysphotopsia. So, Randy, just talk a little quick minute about the difference between the two and why they st everybody thought she was a crank because it was perfect surgery. So positive. Couldn't pull it out. It can be very interesting. Uh, halos around lights, flares that come off things. One of the more interesting ones is you see it, Tim? And uh, that yeah. has to do with the microscopic. It's a backscatter pattern. So take the back lens, front of the lens, and then it goes back and it goes into reverse direction. It's because your brain doesn't correct for it. And so every light they see, there is an oscillation going in the opposite direction of your brain. They can see the light through. It's oscillating. That's right, isn't it?
several others, but another common one is being able to run a city slip report with the Empower calculator. Mm -hmm. It's also a positive if they're having trouble with that. Negative has to do with a, a shadow or a lock position. And uh, there's a big debate about exactly what's causing that. And we've got two big names that are fighting each other in regards to whether or not it has to do with just uh, edge, edge uh, uh, roundness. Basically, is that we hold a shadow that moves and changes depending on where the light is. And there it is. The shadow is greater enough that it darkens an area uh, to the extremely disturbing. And, and obviously, for most sub thresholds, but for those who see it and actually hit it, uh, can become overwhelming. And these, these patients should, you've got to take them seriously. Um, I always ask them to give it six months because they can extend it. And if it's not, you know, you've got to get careful. Yeah, that's it. Everybody see it? There it is. Right there. there it is. Okay, sorry. So here's her pictures that she drew and brought, she, this was part of what she brought to every doctor. Wow. That's one of them. That's one set of pictures. She's sending me six more. Uh, so are, these, are these visible at all? Yes, they do. They do, she, she was sent to she was sent to neurology. Yeah. They, they often get confused that they're having a lock. So that's that. The, the di difference is, is that it's 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 consistent with the light pattern once they've got it in their system. So Randy, look they at the hold their head there. It's yeah, look at the right one. I mean, she literally was when she came into the room. She had the she had visors on. Right. And that, so I I can write her letter. I just show you the letter she sent to me just so you can see. So given. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't. Yeah. It breaks my heart to think of patients living with dysphotopsia. So uh, take your patients. Listen to your patients. You can learn a lot from them. Um, some of them are a little bit odd, but but certainly if she keeps coming back or anybody does and says, "Look, this is a problem," take it for real. And also, so positive dysphotopsia is a real phenomenon. Just, just one other thing about that, Krista. Are you here? So Krista has really one of the seminal papers that just came out last spring, looking at a super normal cohort of these two years out from surgery. And the amazing thing is, is that these are patients who had never complained, uh, had no known other disease, all of them had the same, very complicated surgery. The fact is, is that 80% of those patients had some element of dysphotopsia that was either alive or it was tinged in So we're ignoring it, and, and patients like this get shunted. Well, she gets shunted because she's a PhD in biostatistics, so nobody, nobody did want to operate on that. Second, but she, but she was, she was ecstatic, and she remains ecstatic. Yeah. Alex, what, what did you, did you explain with the lens? I just explained the lens and put in a, don't, don't put in an aspheric lens, basically. So I put in a, I put in a AQ5010. Um, silicone, which unfortunately they've taken away from us, so we have to order them specially. Uh, so we need to we need to deal with that a little bit. Uh, so th that's you know any 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 lens. Yeah. 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 So in a case like this, I, the, you wouldn't don't ex and the other thing is don't think if you if they have a positive dysphotopsy from an Alcon lens or an AMO lens, expanding it for the opposite that doesn't work either. Because the issue is is the is the optics of those lenses, the aspheric lenses, and maybe sometime we could have somebody from your lab explain the differences. I mean, everybody sort of knows what those are, but do they really? Okay. Well, we'll. Get Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. As opposed to acrylic on your cell phone board, that's absolutely not going to be the case. You just run it on your cell phone, so it won't be the case. So you can fix it on the table. And then the second thing, oh, I'm not going to rest of you. Hope you try that. Yeah. And I, you ha I haven't seen the lens grow a haptic yet, have no. you? No. <laughs> okay. So before we've got everybody's attention here, I'm sorry. One other thing, I've got to do a quick plug. We're doing a dry eye study here, and we're looking at a new way of treating dry eyes, and we're looking for people with significant dry eyes, you know, some superfungal keratopathies. So please, if you have any, you know, people with dry eyes, you put the flyers up in the elevator and all over, call Barbara Hart. So we have two two more questions. I think we have two. First, I was going to mention something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but does that show up? Well, that's a very disturbing thing. I'm just wondering how much damage the lens causes. Because it's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. It's standard. Well, if it's in the center. If it's in the center, you have to get rid of it. But uh, if you see that, the first thing you do is you either take the, the Kelman McPherson that they use to grab it and look for defect and, and get the plunger. We had one last week, we had a splint for that reason, and the plunger had a nick in it. So, you know, they're, when they're in a rush in the OR, sometimes they don't clean it well, so they'll have the viscoelastic that's on it that can sometimes scratch it, and then the, the plungers can become damaged. Last question. Okay. So uh, kind of a weird uh, grand rounds, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to discuss ah. these things. All right. Are you kidding? We got thousands. <laughs> yes. They lost. They lost.